This week's section, this week's portion called Behar, in Aramaic, Behar means on the mountain. It talks about a specific mountain, mountain of uh, Sinai. As we open the portion of this week and we get to read what this story speaks about, right at the beginning, the story talks about a concept called Shemitah. Shemitah. Shemitah in Aramaic means sabbatical, a concept of the sabbatical year. What is the idea behind the Shemitah or the sabbatical year? Is the idea that is basically related to farmers, people who work or own a farm, a field, and in the seventh year, according to the laws of the sabbatical year, the owner or the farmer should let the field rest, reboot the energy, let the field breathe. Now, if the field should be left alone in the seventh year for the entire year, this means that the owner of the field or the farmer of the field, that this field is the source of their income, the farmer is supposed to have trust that in the sixth year, somehow, the field will provide for three years of crop or whatever it is that they grow within the field to give them the sustenance for the sixth year, for the seventh year. But since in the seventh year they don't work, so only in the eighth year they're going to work again, and then they will see the outcome only in the ninth year. So this is kind of a very difficult challenge to place in front of anyone. Don't work the field in the seventh year and just trust that something good will happen and the field will provide you for three years. As we learn in Kabbalah, any of the stories that appear in the Torah, in the Bible, they never meant to tell us any piece of history or to tell us some uh, religious laws that people can find within this text. But all the secrets of life were coded within. Obviously, most of us are not farmers. Beside of that, this law specifically of sabbatical year is only for farmers who live in the land of Israel. So we don't live in Israel, and most of us are not farmers. It seems to be that there, there is no relationship between, <laughs> between our lives and, and this portion. So maybe we should just go home. <laughs> As the Kabbalists explain, we don't talk about farmers and we don't talk about the field. This is not the idea behind but when you think about the process of a farmer, we know that there are times the farmer needs to buy the seeds. There are times that the farmer needs to plant the seeds. There will be times that the farmer needs to make sure to water the field, to take care of the process, that everything will be good. This relates in our life to times, to those times, that we need to invest, that we need to make our effort. After the farmer plants the seeds, after the farmer water the field, there is a process that the seeds going through within the ground that as a farmer you cannot control. If you provided the sun, if you provided the water, if you provided the best conditions, there will be always a phase that there is nothing more you can do. You have to let it go through the process in order to develop to the next phase. So we don't really talk about farmers, we don't really talk about a sabbatical year. What do we talk about? We talk about times in our lives where we need to invest, when we need to put our effort in things in order to move life to a new phase. And there are times that we need to know there is nothing we can do. There are times that we need to learn to have that wisdom to take the step back, to let go, to let things to develop. This is the challenge. Since the tendency of most of us is constantly being in a, a mode of what more can I do? What more can I do? Sometimes the best thing you can do is to take the step back. Let things evolve. Let things go through their process. Let things achieve new level of maturity without your energy being injected constantly into, into it. First, I'm going to read in Aramaic. The Zohar and the Aramaic in Kabbalah, it is one of the most powerful tools that we use 
to help us to awaken wisdom. Reading the Aramaic of the Zohar activates a very high frequency of energy within each one of us that bypass all the mind and the limitations and goes directly to awaken a part within our soul that can allow us to connect with a greater level of, of wisdom. So the Zohar writes, Tachezei bnei me'amnuta matberai le'ai le'reutehon b'chol yoma. Maninun bnei me'amnuta inun demitarei aitov lekablei velachas al dilei. ויידי דהה קודשא בריחו יהיב לאה יתיר. כמה דאמר יש מפזר ונוסף עוד מאי טעמה בגין דהה יתאר ביריקן לקבלי ולא ימל אי אתן היי אשתא. מאי יתאביד למחר אלא קודשא בריחו יהיב לאה ביריקן עד בלי די כמה דהו כמוה. So we will read the translation and then we will get into the, the practicality of the understanding. How does it work? for any of us in our lives, and what can we do with this wisdom for this coming week? Come and behold, daily the faith will guide the Malchut according to their wishes. She does as they decree. Who are the faithful? Those who steer good. Yesod, towards her, by giving charity, without sparing their own, knowing that the Holy One, blessed be He, will give them more. As it's written, there is one who gives freely and yet increases. What is the reason for this? That you saw a rose's blessings before him. He must not say, what shall I do tomorrow if I give now? Since the Holy One, blessed be him, bestows upon him blessings without end as explained. What does the Zohar speak about? We know that anything the Zohar talks about is to decode the system, the way that the universe works. The Zohar is mentioning different levels, different dimensions, Malchut, which refers to our physical dimension, this physical world, the level called Yesod, which is in the upper world, in the invisible reality. Yesod is the funnel, channels all the blessings or the abundance down into this world. And the Zohar explains that when we have a certain mindset, not certain actions that we take, but certain mindset, it will be a key to awaken abundance in our lives. As the Zohar mentioned, the idea of giving, we all involve in many different ways of giving in our lives. Many of us strive to find even more ways to help other people, to make a bigger difference, to add more value. It might be to our family, it might be to our neighbors, it might be to our community, it might be to the world. Is the giving itself is what makes the difference. As the Zohar mentioned, the deal those different dimensions, since those different dimensions represent certain type of consciousness. As important are the actions we take in our lives, and it is important taking actions, helping others in our lives, more important than the actions would be what is the consciousness behind what I do? What is the real drive behind my giving. When we speak about the level of Yesod, is the idea of creating an alignment with the level of consciousness of a giver that there is no any type of an agenda attached to my giving. Yesod represents the pure giver inside of each one of us. We all have this level within, activating, igniting our connection with this pure giver within myself, or taking actions of giving that might make even a difference in the life of others. What will determine eventually the outcome, how much of my giving will make a difference and will create a change, it will not be the quantity of my giving, it will be the mindset, the consciousness, how pure am I within my giving. When we look at our lives, and we dare to take the step to, give, to dig within. There are many areas in our lives that we don't really trust. We don't really trust that if I will push myself to do the right things that I believe that they are aligned with my soul, with the pure aspect within me that truly wants to make a difference and to add value in the life of other people in the world, truly believe that following my heart will make a difference, and I have nothing to be afraid. 
since the energy I generate outside will always come back to me. If I would have this level of trust that any time that I extend my kindness, any time that I extend the care I have for other people, any time that I put my even needs aside and I look to find what are the needs of people around me, and I'm trying to get creative about the ways that I can be a channel for fulfilling, assisting, to bring that energy to the life of others, sometimes we worry, if I will not take care of my needs, who is going to take care of it? So we're getting into a frame of mind of I need to take care of my things, and we get to invest and to make an effort and more effort and more effort and more effort, and not always we see the difference. Not always we see that through our effort, gates being opened. Not always through our effort and our investment, we see the expected outcome that we would like to see in our lives. The key, recognize the power in letting go. I think that the first idea of the investment, it is clear to most of us. It is clear, if I will not put an effort in things in life, they will not happen. Is that clear in the same way that if I will not let go, it will not happen? Letting go is one of the most powerful things we can use in our lives. However, it's one of the most challenging things to truly understand what is this letting go about and how do we use the power of letting go. But this is the week that can help each one of us. The energy within this week can help each one of us to awaken a new aspect of the power of letting go in our process. So the first question we want to ask as we prepare ourselves for the spiritual work specifically of this week, will be what is it that you need to let go of? We're going to talk about few ways to let go, few ways to create the room for the energy of the light to come in to our process, into our life, because the work the light can do in our process is much more powerful than any work that we are capable of doing. We can plant the seed, but we cannot get involved in the, the growth and the process of the seed within, without, within the ground. Maybe today with the technology, you know, we can. But in our lives, from the moment you plant the seed, you know, after you water it, there is something needs to happen there. So we talk about few ways of letting go, few directions for the work of this week. The first one is when we get to invest in things and they don't work out. It can be a relationship that we invested for three months or for three years, and we feel and we realize that all the investment that we put within the relationship doesn't get it anywhere. It can be in business. It can be in a deal that you work on six months, you invested so much of your energy in it, but you realize that it's not going to work out. It can be you're working very hard to get a promotion, and you just realize that all the hard work, it doesn't work out. You're not going to get it. At those moments, when we invest our energy and things don't work out, how do you react? How many of us find ourselves frustrated and bitter? Why is it that we getting frustrated? Why is it that we become bitter when we do invest in certain things and they don't work out? Kabbalistically, we need to understand that the only reason, the only reason why we get frustrated and bitter when we invest energy in things and they don't work out, is simply because we don't truly understand why they didn't work out. Yeah. If someone would come and explain to me why they didn't work out, I would be very probably excited <laughs> that it didn't work out. As I was preparing this session, this reminded me a good friend of mine, maybe a year ago, finally came up with the plan, he desired it before, but with a plan to buy his own house. And after searching and a few months, they found the place that they felt it is the right place. 
So after months of investing so much energy and time and effort of finding the house, they found something that they both, the couple both felt it can be the right thing for us. And after all of the investment in illogical way that they could not really understand the why because physically there was no real reason, they ended up not having the house. However, someone else got the house. The first phase, after all the investment of finding the house, they got really bitter and frustrated, as we would expect from anyone. Very quickly, and I'm telling you relatively very quickly, they could elevate themselves to a different place of removing the frustration, removing the bitterness, and realizing that there is a reason why I didn't get the house. And it is not because of the broker who made a mistake. There is a divine plan for me. And if I put the best energy that I can in my process, this divine energy will lead me into my divine plan. Six months later, they found another house. And they were so excited that the first house did not work out. If we would be able to understand why it doesn't happen, we would not be bitter. We would not be frustrated. However, part of the process is there is a concealment. Because if we would be able to be that spiritual, to see constantly why it doesn't work out. After all, my desire is positive and I made so much effort. Why it doesn't work out? Finding the soulmate, getting the deal, finding the house, getting the promotion. Why it doesn't work out? One of the most elevated states one can tap into, according to the teachings of Kabbalah, known as Pkichat Enaim, which is the opening of the eyes. The opening of the eyes, obviously not in the physical level of it, in the spiritual level of it. What is Pkichat Enaim? Is when something happens in illogical way, meaning I invested my effort, everything seemed to be going in the right direction, I could taste already the manifestation, the outcome that I wish it would happen, and it doesn't work out. What is the opening of the eyes? Is the part inside of each one of us that is capable to see why it didn't work out. To reach that level, it takes probably a few lifetimes. However, sometimes I believe that any of you tasted it. When one thing did not work out, but something inside of you told you as much as I wanted it to happen, something internally is telling you, for sure it's the best thing that could happen. I don't know why. I truly would wish it to happen, but something in you doesn't go to this bitter, frustrated place. How many of you knows what I'm talking about? There is lots of power in letting go. Letting go it is not something that you just want to do and do. Letting go it is a muscle that needs to be developed inside of us. In order to plant the seed for the energy of this week, we need to awaken our desire to grow our ability to let go. Because in the moments when things don't work out, especially after we invested our energy into things, it's very difficult to let go. And if someone would tell you, just let go, what would you feel? More bitter. Is that right or no? Don't tell me let go. If you'd be in my shoes, you'd know what I feel. So in the moments that we're already going through the phase, the test is not there to fail us. The test is there to help us grow. In this specific case, the muscle, our power of letting go. So in order to plant the seed, the first thing I want you to do is to take a look at your life. Take a look at something that maybe happened in the past or maybe is happening in your present. An area in your life where you invested or investing energy, but it doesn't work. It doesn't happen. And your natural tendency is to look for more ways of what more can I do without realizing that the most powerful thing you can do is to let go. Where is it in your life that you want to awaken greater ability of letting go? So I'll give you a few minutes. And those of you who feel comfortable as part of our preparation to connect with the energy of the week, share it with 
two friends sitting next to you in groups of three, please. So the first thing that we want with the energy of, of this week, the energy that we want to awaken is to awaken this part that our soul knows, but our mind sometimes forget that even if things don't go as planned, when we are plugged in to the right frequency of consciousness, when we are capable to connect and to awaken the right mindset in those moments, something, as we said before, something inside of us knows. No one needs to convince any of us that when something does not work out, it is simply because life is something better for me. There is so much power in letting go. This is why it is so difficult to let go. Not letting go of your dreams, never let go of your dreams, but letting go on the way that our mind thinks to go, to move in the directions that we think that will be the perfect ways to achieve what we dream and what we want. Letting go of the frustration and the bitterness, letting go of the way that I believe it will be, be the most powerful way to get and to achieve what I want, the moment that I'm capable, capable to let go of my way, to let go of the frustration that is attached to what I want and it doesn't happen, when we let go of that, it creates the room for the light to come in. It creates the room for the better plan to show up. The better plan is already there. But when I'm not able to let go of my plan and my way, the better plan cannot become revealed. There can be obviously many reasons of why it doesn't work out. We are not smart enough to know. Getting to that place of a simple feeling, something in me knows it doesn't work out because there is something better. Maybe there is even a better timing for it to happen. When you realize there is something better, and this is the reason. It's a consciousness that needs to be developed inside of each one of us. And this is the first thing we want to awaken in this week. The second part of letting go, the first part, as we said, is when we invest in things and then don't work out. The second part of letting go is when you get things in life that are not what you envisioned. So you can go simply you're hired, you work in a company, you envision a certain role you're going to have in the company, you ended up to be in a different role. You have a job, but this is not what you envisioned to have. It can be a relationship that seemed to be so um, amazing for the future and ended up not to be exactly the way you envisioned this relationship. It can be simply you woke up with certain plan and it is a raining day, you did not envision the rain. You got something that is not aligned with the vision that you had as far as what you wanted. What do you do? Obviously, the first thing we want to take a look internally is back to the same question. How do you react when you get something that is not aligned with the way you envisioned it? How do you, do you react? How does your system react to that? When we have a plan, our mind have or creates a sequence of events that we need to go through in order to get into manifesting our desires, our dreams. So if I would create the plan, it will go, I need to start with A, I need to go to B, and from B to C, and from C to D, and so on. This is the way that I see I can get eventually to achieve, to accomplish, to manifest dreams, wishes, desires that I have. But this is the linear way of making a plan. The universe doesn't work in a linear way. The universe has the perfect sequence of events to get you the quickest into your destination. And sometimes it will be going from A to Z, going back to C and moving to H. But it's not what I envisioned. 
I envision that in this phase of my life, this is what will happen. So we find ourselves in a phase that is not aligned with what we wanted. There is something different in it. Not like in the first thing that things don't work out. No, things worked out, but not according to what I wanted. The universe does not work in a linear way. There is a divine energy that knows how to move each one of us the quickest from where we are to eventually to the soul destiny, to our divine destiny. And when we find ourselves in the place that it is not what we envisioned, we need to remember that this phase, it is just a phase. And this phase, it's a phase that you have to go through. You cannot run away from this phase. You cannot skip over this phase. More frustrated you are within this phase, more energy you create to delay the move to the final destination. More bitter I am in where I am, more delaying power I'm injecting into my process and it will take even longer. What is the way to shorten the process? Finding the happiness in where you are. Finding the happiness in where you are. Yes, we do need to get creative in the way that we look at our lives. Yes, we do need to make an effort to elevate our vision and our perception, to put different lenses, to realize something that we cannot realize through the reactive system and the reactive mind. When I'm finding myself in a place that this is not what I envision for myself, this is the moment when you want to inject this new level of consciousness. This is not about trust, everything is going to be okay. This is not about inject certainty. Certainty is an effect. Certainty is an effect of bringing myself into a state of happiness in where I am. When we're in a place in life that we feel there is something we have to have in order to be happy, this is one of the indications that I'm out of alignment, out of balance. There is nothing at the soul level that you have to have in order to be happy. Because where you are, this is where you need to find your happiness. Where you do find the happiness in where you are, this is where the universe is already moving you to the next phase. Works the opposite of the way we interpret life according to the logic mind. When I will move to the next phase, I will be happy. When I will live the life that I'm envisioning for myself, then I will be happy. This, unfortunately, what delaying the entire process. What is that letting go in this phase? Letting go, as we said, it's a muscle that needs to be developed. It will not be just meditate to let go. It will not just say to myself, I need to let go. It is to get myself to that place of realizing in where I am, how blessed I am. When you realize in where you are, how blessed you are, you are ready for the next phase. How long will it take you to realize how blessed you are? This is how long it will take you to move to the next phase. So the second energy, the second level of power that we want to awaken relating to the power of letting go is when we find ourselves in the place that is not in alignment with what we envisioned for ourselves. We would believe, we would think that in this phase of life or this phase of our process, we would be in a different place of achievements, of accomplishments, of relationships, of whatever it is. The work is pause, or the chase is to make the effort of finding the happiness in where you are. Realizing how blessed you are in where you are. This is the most powerful fuel you can inject into your process in this phase to move you to the next phase. With the second idea of the letting go, where in your life do you feel you need to awaken more of this consciousness? When we share, it's a way to open up spiritual channels and gates for the energy to become even more awakened inside of us. So just a few minutes, share one area in your life where you feel that you need more of this energy to be able to feel how blessed you are in where you are. A few minutes, please. So before we leave, I want to share with you one idea that relates to this last concept that we shared that can be a practical tool. This comes from a Kabbalist uh, known as Fatemet. He explains that there are blessings in our life 
that they are under the category of natural blessings. Natural blessings. They are not supernal blessings. They are not amazing, uplifted blessings in the way that we view them. What are the natural blessings that we have? If you think about a natural blessing we have at the moment, we all breathe. The ability to walk, the ability to talk, the ability to think, the ability to love, relationships that we have. Think that there will be, at least in our mind, as part of the category of natural blessings. It can be that you even invest in certain things that they do work out. They didn't have to work out. But they do work out. He explains, when you start to get your mind into recognizing, awakening the gratitude for the blessings that seem to be so trivial in life, it will be the pathway to awaken the blessings that they are beyond the level of where you are today. So our mind many times is rushing into that place. Of course, we have desires, we want more, which is amazing. But very often our mind goes into when the next thing will happen. The next thing can happen tomorrow. We need to get ourselves ready for the next thing to come. And the pathway of inviting the next phase of our blessings, he explains, is take your mind, make five minutes a day. Take yourself through a thinking process, a little meditation, where you put your mind in those blessings that normally, yes, I know it's a blessing to breathe, but you know, no. Get yourself to feel how blessed you are we don't, within the frame of those kind of natural blessings in your life, things that just work out. But again, when we're getting our energy into that place, feel, awaken this gratitude for the amazing things that do work out in your life. Instead of having the mind, I don't want to say 90%, but big part of our lives, in what we are lacking and what we don't have and what is it that I'm working towards and doesn't always manifest in the ways that I want. No. Take your mind to the place of recognizing what do work in your life. And as you get yourself into that place, into that zone, when you start to recognize and to feel in a deeper level those blessings that he called them the natural blessings, to realize that they're not really natural there has to be some powerful divine energy that makes them work. Because they could be different. And as you recognize this divine energy within what you have naturally, you're paving the path to awaken the blessings that they are beyond your level to manifest. Five minutes a day to dedicate in your life every day, at least this week, to put your mind to recognize and to awaken a real, true, deep gratitude for all the things that do work in your life. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us.